So I'm very blessed and honored to share with you some of my memories and my inspiration about two people who were essential to the founding and development of the unity movement, to the growth of the unity movement, to unity as we know it today. James Dillett Freeman and Mae Rowland. First, I wanna begin by saying that unity is not a new religion. You don't have to leave your religion to join unity. Unity originated as an educational offering for people of all religions and as a ministry of prayer to teach people the kind of prayer, affirmative prayer that healed our co-founder Myrtle Fillmore of what was told to her to be tuberculosis that would take her in three months. She was not expected to live long. She was told she was a sick and weakly child and uh, she lived a long and healthy life after she learned these practical daily teachings we call unity. Unity is a collection of techniques in spiritual living that consists of thoughts to think, words to speak, healing treatments, creative visualizations, and positive, uplifting daily practices. Unity is a movement, not a monument to our co founders <laughs> or to Christ Jesus. Unity is a movement based on affirmative prayer and silent meditation practiced individually and in groups. James Dillard Freeman, <laughs> a poet, a rebel, and a mystic, came to Unity as a very young poet at the request of Myrtle Fillmore to work in silent unity. May Rowland, the young director of Silent Unity at the time remembers thinking, the last thing we need in Unity right now is a young poet, or for that fact, any kind of poet at all. But Jim surprised her and became her coworker for over 50 years. And he has written most of our best loved prayers, many of our best loved poems, and many pamphlets anonymously over those years. He also wrote the column, Life is a Wonder in Unity Magazine for his entire life. Jim first came to Unity as a teenager because this cute blonde named Catherine asked him to join a youth gathering at what was then called Unity Farm. And she said she would drive. And a year later, she became his wife. Jim was a young man in love with his beautiful wife, Catherine, when she was diagnosed with cancer. He was totally unprepared for the possibility that Catherine might die. He didn't think he could live without her. He had a very difficult childhood with an alcoholic and abusive father. And Catherine was the first person to truly, he felt, love him just the way he was. She was the love of his life, his first love and his best friend. He told me she would even put my clothes out for me in the morning <laughs> and cook me my meals. <laughs> and he was devastated at the possibility of losing her. While she was in the hospital, very ill, really on her deathbed, he went into the hospital chapel and he cried out to God. Tears screaming, he was screaming, tears were running down his face. He said he was so angry, so, so grief stricken. And in that moment, he heard an audible voice. Jim, do you need me? 
I am there. And this poem that we know is I am there came to Jim and he says, he said, it was the first and only time he heard an audible voice. He said, I often hear a still small whisper. I'm always listening for the still small voice, but this was a loud voice and it was not my voice. He simply wrote down what the voice said so he could share it with Catherine. And I wanna share it with you. Do you need me? I am there. You cannot see me and I'm the light you see by. You cannot hear me and I speak through your voice. You cannot feel me, yet I am the power at work in your hands. I am at work though you do not understand my ways. I am at work though you do not understand my works. I am not strange visions. I am not mysteries. Only in absolute stillness beyond self can you know me as I am. Then, but as a feeling and a faith, yet I am there, yet I hear, yet I answer. When you need me, I am there. Even if you deny me, I am there. Even when you feel most alone, I am there. Even in your fears, I am there. Even in your pain, I am there. I'm there when you pray and when you do not pray. I'm in you and you're in me. Only in your mind can you feel separate from me. For only in your mind are the mists of yours and mine. Yet, only with your mind can you know me and experience me. Empty your heart of empty fears. Get yourself out of the way. I am there. You can of yourself do nothing, but I can do all and I am in all. Though you may not see the good, good is there. For I am there. I am there because I have to be, because I am. Only in me does the world have meaning. Only out of me does the world take form. Only because of me does the world go forward. I am the law on which the movement of the stars and the growth of living cells is founded. I'm the love that's the laws fulfilling. I am assurance. I am peace. I am oneness. I am the law you can live by. I'm the love you can cling to. I'm your assurance. I'm your peace. I am one with you. I am. Though you fail to find me, I do not fail you. Though you fail to have faith in me and your faith is unsure, my faith in you never wavers because I know you because I love you, beloved, I am there. Can you imagine being in your 20s and having your beloved on their deathbed and hearing that voice, a loud voice speaking that prayer? Jim felt that out of all the things and he doesn't even say he wrote it, all of the things that came to him <laughs> to publish. Many years later, he published this. He didn't publish it right away. He didn't feel it was his. Of all of the things published in his name, that one has meant the most to people. And it was taken to the moon by Colonel James Irwin on Apollo 15 in 1971. Astronaut Irwin left, I am there, in a sealed capsule for space voyagers. We call Jim Freeman the poet of the stars <laughs> because two, not just one, that would be great enough, right? But two of his poems are on the moon. In 1969, Colonel Edward Buzz Aldrin carried the prayer 
of protection with him on Apollo 11 when he made his historic moonwalk. He didn't know James Dilla Freeman. He'd never heard of unity. But that prayer that we shared earlier, the prayer of protection, spoke to him. He had his whole community. I forget what denomination he was, but he had his whole community write that prayer out and put it on the walls of their church for him. And he took that with him when he walked on the moon. The prayer of protection was written by Jim during World War II at a request of a coworker in silent unity. She thought the 23rd Psalm was too depressing. <laughs> you know, the 23rd Psalm, yay, though I walk in the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for thou art with me. She said, that's, that's not helpful. <laughs> and Jim thought, oh my God, this woman's crazy. How can I write something better than the 23rd Psalm? But crazy or not, lines kept coming to him. And it took him a while to get these very simple, very concise lines, especially that last line, wherever we are, God is, or wherever I am, God is. And we add and all as well, but that wasn't Jim's. And he doesn't mind. He says, you can add anything you want but his ended with wherever we are, God is. Jim survived the loss of his wife, Catherine. He eventually married again and had a long, happy marriage to another silent unity coworker named Billy. Jim's wife, Billy, was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease when I was in ministerial school. And I watched Jim struggle with caring for her and making the right choices for her. He shared with me one day when we were walking in the woods, the people were pressuring him to put Billy in a nursing home and he couldn't do it. He told me, you know, that thing about in sickness and health, I take that quite literally. And standing by Billy in her disease, if I can't do it, then I can't demonstrate what love really is. It was difficult, it was challenging, and he knew it was his to do. He would sit with Billy and hold her hand, and once in a while, she would say, I love you. But he was never sure if she knew who he was. He said, I miss her, and she's here. I love you were the last words she ever spoke to him. James Dillon Freeman faced heartbreaking loss twice in his life, but it did not leave him morose or sorrowful. Oh, he grieved, but he was always ready for fun and considered joy and laughter to be an essential part of the spiritual life. During my time in ministerial school, when he was in his 80s, late 80s, I asked him if he would um, help us to create biblical skits, totally unrehearsed, extemporaneously. We acted out Bible stories and we made up music, you know, Jesus in the boat. and We had our rhythm instruments and the waves came and the wind. And Jim was with us laughing and he was like the minstrel in the middle of the sea. He told us that he felt that this kind of activity was what Jesus was all about and what unity was all about. He said this, and I quote him, Jesus was not what they made him to be, and neither is God. I've come to love Jesus. I used to not even think he existed, that the whole thing was a hoax. But I've come to love what he stands for, whether he existed or not. He said, I believe that God is a God of love and I believe him because only love and joy could create you. Only love and joy could have created this world. If you want to practice truth, Jim always taught, practice joy. Jim admitted that May Rowland, the very first director of Silent Unity taught him to smile. 
and to be a cheerful person. He said before coming to Silent Unity, he was not a smiling young man. And he could be quite irritable and moody for long periods of time. But May Roland, his wife Catherine, and his wife Billy, and what he called all the great ladies and gentlemen of Silent Unity, taught him the importance of having a cheerful countenance. They were his greatest teachers. <clears throat> May Rowland was born in 1894 and she passed away in 1977. She was chosen by the Fillmores to become the first director of Silent Unity when she was in high school. She was the director of the first 24 hour prayer ministry in this world when she wasn't old enough to vote. She was the spiritual leader of the movement from 1916 to 1971, 50 years. Anyone who knew May Rowland could see she had spiritual power. Those around her tell me they felt it, they could sense it, they knew it. When May Rowland began Silent Unity, there were about 100,000 letters to be written every year. And when she left, there were close to a million letters being written every year. She grew the movement. She grew the consciousness of prayer in the people that she served. One of the things that she did is during the holidays, when the numbers of letters in demand would triple, she would say to her coworkers, there's a greater demand. It's going to be hard on us this week. So you make sure you take more time to pray. She understood this and she inspired this in others to live a life of prayer. And through prayer, through God, all things would be possible, even triple letter writing. May Roland had immense faith in God and in people. She would go every day making the rounds in unity, finding things to affirm in other people. She said, it was my job to be a stand for the unity teachings. So I stood for the truth that I knew. I affirmed the truth and I waited for the results. Truth is truth. Because I was the director of silent unity did not make me special or different. May Rowland had faith and spiritual power. Once, many, many years ago, during a tornado that was headed towards the Silent Unity building, people were terrified because it was the tallest building in the Kansas City area. May Rowland went outside. She stood with her hands up and she simply said, divine order is now occurring in the weather as they watched the tornado change direction. <laughs> May Rowland had the kind of faith that can move tornadoes, yet she claimed no spiritual unique power. She said, people ask me all the time, what is unity? And I answer, unity in silent unity is simply a group of people who are learning the truth, teaching the truth, and practicing the truth. If we are to carry on this work, that has to be our focus too, on practice, on being a stand for what we believe in. Whether we're poets, rebels, or mystics, or like Charles Fillmore, a bit of a cynic, or like Myrtle Fillmore, they used to describe her as coming from another planet, Whatever our inclinations, personally, we must be willing to study, to learn, and to practice the teachings at Unity of Santa Maria, like those who've gone before us, we're learning the truth, we're teaching the truth, we're practicing the truth, and we're holding to the truth for ourselves, each other and our world.